legislation passed in 2010. Um, those of us who work in the single payer movement, and, and it was a really tremendous year for the movement because there was a lot of growth, a lot of people that came out, worked really hard to try to push to have this heard. Um, around the same time that the bill passed, the president created something called the National Commission for Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. Have you guys heard of this? The Deficit Commission? And um, they were supposed to find ways to deal with our, our national deficit. And when we looked at who was on that commission and who was backing it, which was the Pete Peterson Foundation, a private foundation that has for decades tried to get rid of our, what they call entitlement programs, we call them social insurances. Um, we were very concerned. And so I and others in the single payer movement went and testified before the deficit commission on why they should not look at cutting our, our social insurances like Medicare, but actually they should look at expanding our Medicare to everybody and improving it. Um, and if you want to read that testimony, it's on the website of PHP. But basically, um, our health care costs in this country are growing way too fast. They're growing faster than our GDP. Um, you may have seen the, in the news just came out recently about health insurance premiums for employers. Sponsor plans rose by 9% but wages only rose by 2%. That's the trend that we've been seeing for a while, that actually health insurance premiums are rising on average three times faster than wages and four times faster than inflation. It's estimated that at this rate, and this was done by Uwe Reinhardt at um, Princeton, an, an economist, that in 2025, our health care costs per person and our income, average income, are going to meet. So it's just not sustainable. And the effects of our health care costs, as I said, it's bad for business, it's bad for families, if they don't have discretionary funds to spend on other things that help the economy go, um, it's just bad. So um, what the Deficit Commission has been looking at is ways to cut Medicare. And we think this is really the wrong approach because the pressure on Medicare is, exists because we don't have a health care system that controls health care costs. So, of course, every part of that system is under stress. We really see Medicare as more of a victim of not having a health care system that controls costs effectively. And when you look at the rise in cost of Medicare for the right, compared to our rise in cost on the private side, we see that Medicare does much better. It's growing much more slowly. Um, so that's not the thing to go after if we want to actually solve our, our health care problems. Um, a national improved Medicare for All has proven cost controls. For one thing, the administrative costs that I mentioned, going from 33% to about 3%. Um, but the other is that, and this is kind of a no-brainer, we don't have any real way of negotiating for fair prices for services in this country or for pharmaceuticals. And we actually spend the most on these things in this country compared to other countries. So when you have a national system, suddenly you have real bargaining power so that the pharmaceutical companies can bring their prices down. Um, the other thing is that it allows us to adopt budgets. Every hospital and institution would get a global operating budget. They wouldn't have to worry <coughs> about attracting patients with fancy you know, procedures and fancy technology. They would just know that they would have enough money to take care of the people in their community. And this is really important because we're seeing around the country that public hospitals that serve Communities that um, you know don't have high incomes are being closed down, and that wouldn't happen under a single payer system. So, really, you know, having a single payer system would have a positive effect on our economy. It would allow us to control our health care costs, making it for businesses so they could be more competitive, relieving a lot of stress on our families, allowing them to have more discretionary income. It's also estimated that a single payer plan because of all these factors, would increase the number of jobs in this country. It would change the jobs. We'd have fewer people being insurance administrators. Many people have actually left direct patient care to become administrators because of their frustration with the system that's going on. They could actually move back into direct care. But the situation that we're in right now is really pretty serious. Um, you know, Medicare and Medicaid are under attack by both the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, the Republicans are talking about creating Medicare vouchers so that instead of having guaranteed Medicare benefits, seniors would be given a certain amount of money to go into the market and purchase private insurance. Well, seniors haven't had to buy private insurance, you know, full benefits for a long time, for 46 years in this country, and we estimate the cost would be very high. And the way that they fashioned it is that the rise in the subsidies would be less 
than the rise in health care costs. So over time, it would be a shrinking amount of money that seniors would have to pay for their health care. The seniors are already struggling um, with health care costs. For those who are uh, under 200% of the federal poverty level in income, which is a large percentage of seniors, they're already spending 15 to 22% of their income out of pocket on health care. So there's not very much wiggle room there to take on more costs. Um, we see this new super committee um, is being tasked with coming up with legislation to address the deficit that's to be presented to Congress for an up or down vote. No amendment process. This is really stealing our democracy. And they've been tasked with cutting Medicare. They're not able to control our deficit. Again, it's just the wrong approach. They say that, oh, we're not going to cut services, we're just going to cut reimbursement. But when you cut reimbursement, it doesn't take much for you to realize you've cut access to services. Um, so for me, the reason that I, I do this work is that we're already spending enough money in this country. It's not a matter of money. If we spent the same amount of money on health care, on actual health care, we could cover everybody with comprehensive benefits throughout their life. Um, so it's not a matter of that. It's not a matter of infrastructure. You know, we have hospitals, we have facilities, we have doctors, we could train more doctors, we need to get more doctors into primary care. Um, and probably they would more move into primary care if we had this type of system, um, because right now we're not making it as primary care doctors. Um, we're under a lot of pressure. And the majority of medical students actually go into medical school wanting to do primary care. But by the end, with their debt and the low reimbursement rates that primary care doctors receive, they have to make an economic decision, and more and more of them are going into specialties that are higher paying. And so we're really losing our primary care docs. But what's exciting to me is that for the first time in 10 years, last year in 2010, we saw more students choosing to go into primary care. And we think that might be because health care reform was on the table, and they probably thought things were going to get better. So they saw some hope. So I think if we can give them more hope, they'll, they'll come into more primary care. We actually have public support for this proposal. Um, polls have been done for decades now. Independent polls have shown clearly around 65% of people in the United States support this approach. And then the polls of physicians also show that a majority of physicians support this. Um, there was a poll done in 2002, a national poll of physicians across specialties, it was repeated in 2007. In that five-year period, we saw a 10% increase in the number of doctors that support this. It went from 49% to 59%. Um, and my experience traveling around the country and speaking to doctors is there's really a level of desperation out there, and we're looking for solutions. And I think even more doctors are, are coming on board with this. We have the health policy experts. The Taiwanese system was the most recent single-payer system to be instituted in the world. And they used our health policy experts to design it here at Harvard and Princeton. Um, so we do have the knowledge, but unfortunately what we found in Congress in 2009 and 2010 was that it wasn't a matter of policy or knowledge or evidence. It was completely driven by the industries, the health insurance corporations, the huge hospital corporations, the pharmaceutical corporations. And they heavily influenced, and some of them helped write the legislation to benefit them. There was, um, there's a British journal called The Lancet. It's a British medical journal. And in uh, December of 2009, the cover of their issue said um, that the U.S. government has proved itself to be incapable of enacting reform on the basis of evidence or the public interest. I mean, do you get any more blunt than that? <laughs> So that's really what led to our action in the Senate Finance Committee, was that we were meeting with members of Congress, we were meeting with leadership in Congress, we were presenting them with the data, and initially they were very welcoming, and, oh yes, of course, you should be considered, and, and we just said, we want two things. With everyone we met, we said, when you put your bill together, you compare it to our bill on the basis of how many people are covered and how much it costs. Just do that. And what we found is when the, the hearings started happening first in the Senate Finance Committee, and we asked if our experts could come and testify, and we looked at who they invited, and it was the CEO of Blue Cross, it was the health insurance lobbyist, uh, Karen Ignani, it was the pharmaceutical lobbyist, Billy Towson, it was the head of the business roundtable in the Chamber of Commerce, and it was all 
industry and business, and it wasn't, you know, like the health policy experts or the patients or the people that work in the system that kind of know what's going on there. So um, we asked, will you let us have somebody testify? And they said no. So we turned to our grassroots base and we sent out emails and we said, if you're in this senator's district in a state, will you write the finance committee and ask them, you know, or call them and ask them to include a single payer person? And we had thousands of emails and phone calls. We actually found out that we had a friend in the Senate Finance Committee office. And um, he was a single payer supporter, a young man. And so when we called up, he'd say, get lots of calls, keep going. <laughs> but on the Monday before that hearing, when we called him, um, we were told no more invitations would be issued. So there we were. We have the evidence of what works. We're being shut out. Do we just go home at this point and go away and say, gosh, we tried, darn, you know, maybe next time? That was not even an option for us. Because every day I hear stories, healthcare stories in this country, things that never should happen. And those people are counting on us. Everybody is counting on us. We're all counting on each other, right, to, to make this happen. So we went down there, and, and I never dreamed that I was going to stand up and get arrested. That just hadn't been in my kind of consciousness. <laughs> but I was pretty upset. So, and actually my good friend who's a lawyer was one of the ones that was arrested. Um, he's actually been working in social justice for about 30 years, so he has been arrested before, so we used him to like tell us like, you know, what's it like and what we're going to expect. And so we had these conference calls where he, you know, prepped us. He was sitting like two rows behind me and he's going, <sighs> so much that the woman sitting next to him said, are you okay? <laughs> and he goes, I'm just a little nervous. <laughs> second because I knew that if I didn't do it, I couldn't ask my colleagues to do it if I wasn't willing to do it. So it was pretty nerve-wracking, but you know, it did have an effect. And I did, I was called by Senator Kennedy's committee, he was alive at that point, and I was the first person to testify in the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee. And we did testify in every committee in the House, every committee of jurisdiction. They didn't listen to us, <laughs> but it went on record, so that was good. So, um, so what did I learn out of kind of that experience? And, you know, we tried everything we could think of to have our voices heard or to get it out into the public that this was not being heard, that this was being suppressed. Um, I learned three kind of principles that we're going to need to follow if we want to get a single payer system. And they actually, the initials are ICU. So I think about we're in a health care crisis. We need ICU. But doesn't stand for intensive unit. It stands for independent. We need to build an independent movement. One that's not allied to political parties so that it doesn't compromise based on that political party's agenda. One that says, you know, we're going to keep pushing on you no matter what till you do the right thing. We need clarity. We must educate ourselves about what works and what doesn't work because, to put it quite bluntly, we're outright told lies. After the Affordable Care Act passed, the members of Congress were going around and saying, oh, it's universal, it's guaranteed, it's affordable. It's none of those things. I mean, it's called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, and it doesn't protect patients, and it's not going to lead to affordable care. So we have to know what actually would do that so we don't get fooled. And the third thing, you, is uncompromising. We have to stop settling for crumbs. You know, our... our People across the <laughs> people in other countries don't settle for what we settle for. You know, and we, we do, we accept it. We're told this is what's on the table. These are your choices, and we know they're not adequate choices, but we accept them because we're told that's all we can get. So we really have to stop doing that. So um, so I really want to get on to questions and hear from you about what your concerns are because there has been a lot of misinformation out there. The